Good morning. On behalf of the patient safety authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar entitled pharmacists role in patient safety more than meets the eye. My name is Shirley Dominic, and I will be your moderator for this program. Now, I'd like to introduce our 3 speakers for today's webinar. 1st, we have Megan Scheid who serves as the medication safety officer for Reading hospital of the tower health system. Megan obtained her doctorate of pharmacy from the University of Pittsburgh and completed her PGY1 pharmacy practice residency at Duke University Medical Center. Megan maintains certifications as a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and a certified professional in patient safety. Second, we have Jennifer Kunkel, who serves as a medication safety officer for Jefferson Abington Health System overseeing both Abington and Lansdale hospitals. Additionally, Jennifer has been a PGY1 pharmacy residency program director for over 10 years and continues to hold this responsibility in her current position. Jennifer is a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and a board certified critical care pharmacist and has spent over a decade as a critical care pharmacy specialist. And lastly, we have Christopher Walsh, who serves as a medication safety pharmacist for Penn State Health St. Joseph's Medical Center. Christopher has practiced in both acute and long care pharmacies. While participating in Temple's post baccalaureate PharmD program, he realized his passion for medication error prevention. He then enrolled in Temple's medication safety certificate program where he became the Institute for Safe Medication Practices Scholar in Residence and Safe Medication Management Fellow. There he learned medication error preventions from leading experts in the field and co-authored several published research articles on medication safety. It is now my pleasure to turn the program over to Megan. Thank you very much, Shirley. Our objectives for today is we will start by describing the benefits of engaging staff in identifying and reporting medication safety concerns. Next, we'll look to identify opportunities for collaboration of the medication safety officer with healthcare workers. And finally, to identify three medication safety initiatives that could be implemented in a healthcare facility. I will be reviewing three topics to start us off. First, I will review barcode medication safety. Next, a uh, novel medication labeling safety contest. And finally, the good catch, great catch safety recognition program in place at our institution. Barcode medication scanning at the time of medication administration is a widely adopted error prevention strategy that has been in place for many years. Medication errors in healthcare facilities are common and unfortunately may be associated with patient harm. As cited here, one third of serious medication errors were noted to occur at the stage of medication administration. Therefore, technology solutions were developed to prevent errors at this stage. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2010 noted a 51% reduction in medication administration errors that were not associated with timing following the implementation of barcode scanning. Prior to this work, a 2002 study conducted by the VA demonstrated significant reductions of five specific types of errors. What they found in their work was a greater than 75% improvement in wrong medication errors, a 62% improvement in wrong dose errors, a 93.5% improvement in wrong patient identification errors, an 87% improvement with wrong timing associated errors, and a 70% improvement in medication omission errors. Barcode medication scanning allowed for real-time identification of an impending error and allows for staff intervention. While impressive, note that the efficacy rate is not 100% of the errors prevented. Some errors still did occur, and that was attributed by the authors to workarounds from the BCMA system. When we discuss compliance with barcode scanning, we're looking at successful scanning of both the patient bracelet and the medication. These two components are measured separately and both required for successful scanning. The LeapFrog Group is a nonprofit organization that aims to positively influence change in healthcare. They advocate for transparency and collect, analyze, and disseminate data. 
the LeapFrog Group had established a 95% compliance goal for BCMA, and that has publicly been reported by this group since 2016. At our facility, barcode scanning compliance is routinely monitored by the Medication Safety Committee. The data show that the hospital as a whole was consistently achieving and exceeding the 95% goal. Closer analysis of the data, as well as the internal reporting system, however, did reveal some opportunities for improvement. Therefore, we raised the bar and stretched our goal to see if we could achieve a 98% compliance. This took a collaborative effort between the medication safety officer, as well as multiple other departments, uh, notably nursing and also our IT department for data-driven improvement efforts. And I really wanna underscore the work that it took from our IT department to make sure we had the best tools and analytics available for us. This slide shows our data for the last couple of years uh, on a quarterly basis. The yellow bar you'll see sets the leapfrog goal looking at a 95% compliance, whereas the gray bar was the reach goal that we established, seeing if we could achieve 98%. Of note, at our facility, we administer over 10,000 barcode eligible medications every single day. So 1% improvement in our scale equates to between 100 and 120 more medications administered with a successful scan every single day. So through our data driven efforts, we were able to get our average up over a full set percentage point above that goal, which corresponds to significant impact to preventing error and ensuring the correct medications are identified. One particular unit was found to be below the leapfrog goal at the onset of this work. From analysis of the data, targeted efforts identified workflow opportunities that were amenable to improvement. This area, as you can see, is now a leader in scanning compliance as they started below our threshold and now has been consistently exceeding and achieving it. Next, I'd like to share some information about efforts undertaken by our system to address patient safety with medication labeling. Medications with similar appearance or packaging are designated as lookalike medications. The hazards associated with these are a risk of a wrong medication error if the incorrect medication is selected. The Institute for Safe Medication Practices has advocated for awareness of lookalike medications and has extensively published reports regarding this concern. This was proactively raised as a concern by our staff and in 2019 was identified to be an opportunity for error prevention within our facility. We decided to hold a contest to include and challenge staff to identify medication labeling safety concerns. Our frontline staff who handle medications every day are in the best position to recognize these hazards. We wanted to create an opportunity to directly include our staff in the solution. Two categories of particular concern for lookalike medications and we later also added barcode concerns. As previously discussed, barcode scanning is an integral component to our medication safety practices. Not all medications come to us with optimal barcodes, and we wanted to capture this as well. The contest was initiated in the pharmacy department at one hospital, and over the years, it expanded to include all staff within that hospital and then the full health system. We've held this contest for four years now, the timing has been variable, but recently we've been using World Patient Safety Day for the kickoff, and you can mark your calendars, that is September 17th, and then wrapping up our contest by Pharmacy Week, which occurs in October. The request is simply to have staff submit photographs of the medication that is found to be of concern. And the only requirement is to ensure that there's no protected health information, such as would be on a patient-specific label, included in the photograph. A panel of judges who are blind into the entries votes for winners, and prizes and recognition then go to all participants. In follow up, all entries are evaluated for the risk of a mix up as well as for patient harm. We've had many changes occur within our institution looking at improvements related to this work. We've made changes to internally prepared labels to better differentiate those particular products. We have updated storage of different medications to separate things that would be at risk for being a mix up. We've changed purchasing to look at different manufacturers, and we've also changed different strengths that are stopped. 
And all of the, the manufacturer level concerns are submitted to ISMP to allow for additional follow up at that level. And all the photographs included in these slides were submissions to our contest. As we discussed, recognition and involvement of our staff is of critical importance. So I also wanted to mention our Good Catch, Great Catch program. It's important to us to support a culture of safety and to include all of our staff in that work. We were looking for opportunities to increase our incident reporting within our internal reporting system. We not nominate good catches for recognizing our staff to identify an event or a situation that could be harmful to a patient and that staff member took action to intervene and prevent an error from occurring. These are sometimes also known as near misses or close calls. Once a month, we also recognize a great catch and that identifies an exceptional intervention. For our good catch system, we accept nominations through our internal uh, event reporting system. These can either be made directly by the recorder who's submitting a concern. They can also nominate themselves or a colleague. File managers later who are reviewing and responding to those incident reports can also acknowledge and nominate staff. The patient safety team then reviews these nominations to determine the distribution of the awards. We've been seeing an increase in incident reporting corresponding with our increase in distributing our good catch awards over the years. And correspondingly, looking at our medication events, those have been increasing as well. And we have seen an increase in the number of pharmacy staff who are receiving those awards as well. In 2019, we had 243 awards uh, distributed. This increased um, to double in 531 in 2020. In 2021, we saw 715 uh, good catches that we recognized. And then for 2022, for the first three quarters of the year, we had already exceeded that with 770 individuals recognized for their good catch awards. The awards include recognition within our facility, that includes letters to their leadership or supervisors and postings of their story in general terms within the hospital wide website and internal media publications. The awards that the participants get include the good catch pin on um, those who have multiple awards also receive points within our recognition system at our facility. And the great catch winner receives a trophy, which is uh, set to the unit as well as one that they are able to keep in recognition that that unit had that significant great catch, which is rewarded only to one person once a month. Thank you very much. And I would like to turn the presentation over to Jennifer. Hi, and thank you, Megan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. So the topics I'm going to be covering today include establishing an enterprise med safety committee, as well as reviewing our nurse driven heparin protocol. So first talking about an enterprise med safety committee. So a little bit of background about my institution. As stated, I am the med safety officer for Jefferson Abington Health, which includes both Abington and Lansdale Hospital. Abington is a community teaching hospital with over 665 licensed beds and six residency programs. In contrast, Lansdale Hospital is a much smaller community hospital. Both these institutions are part of our Jefferson Enterprise, which consists of 18 hospitals, many outpatient clinics. We are primarily located in the greater Philadelphia region with some facilities also in South Jersey. Of note, the Enterprise Jefferson Enterprise has grown by leaps and bounds over the past seven years from only three hospitals to 18. So as these large enterprise type health systems grow, we often use the term alignment, but what exactly do we need to align? As the med safety officer, it is important to not only align medications, but also ensure that we maintain safety mechanisms for our patients. So what actually needs to be aligned? Things such as order sets, drug concentrations, more specifically relating to our standard concentrations, similar to what ASHP recommends, this includes both continuous infusions, such as norepinephrine and heparin, as well as intermittent type infusions, such as antibiotics. 
Furthermore, this also impacts each institution's intravenous pumps. Not only do they require the same concentrations, but also the same durations or rate of infusions. Finally, this all comes together in the electronic health record. And I do want to emphasize that these are only a few of the alignment opportunities that exist within a health system. So now that we've attempted to at least align everything prior to the EHR go live, what happens after we go live? So unfortunately, after go live, we continue to identify issues that require modifications to our electronic health record. Oftentimes, these are reported as medication events in our event reporting system. These often require enterprise approval. And those of you on this call may wonder, what exactly does that mean? How do we obtain enterprise or health system approval? Although there were already multiple system-wide committees who were meeting prior to our EHR go live, such as an antibiotic stewardship committee and oncology subcommittee to discuss updates, there were a lot of gray areas. So in order to streamline this process, the enterprise med safety huddle was created. This was started just last year in May of 2022. We meet on a monthly basis and incorporate representatives from all six divisions. This has enabled the enterprise to make quick, effective, and safe decisions when updating our electronic health record and beyond. Some examples are listed on this slide and will be highlighted during this presentation. Furthermore, it has enabled the med safety officers to discuss any other medication events and solutions as a team. So one example I'd like to highlight is a potential error. Upon the go live with our electronic health record, our two gram and 50 ml IV piggyback magnesium writer appeared as it is displayed in the example on the top of this slide. The number two, was immediately followed by the capital letter G. Not only did this appear in the electronic health record on the computer, but also on the drug label. This could easily cause confusion of 20 to zero grams. We quickly addressed this issue by changing the name to two grams with the lowercase g and a space between in 50 ml bolus, as you'll see on the lower example on the slide. Furthermore, more recently, we have begun to optimize our event reporting system. Although this event reporting system is used for all events throughout the institution and enterprise, we specifically as medication safety officers look at adverse drug reactions and medication events. The example on this slide demonstrates how we have attempted to optimize the ADR reporting screens. For example, our goal is to easily classify ADRs that occur in the hospital versus those that occurred outpatient, whether at home or at another facility. So on this slide, you'll see we can easily have the submitters click either yes or no to that question. Moving on, I'll be speaking about our nurse-driven heparin protocol. This was also an enterprise-wide initiative. However, prior to implementing the nurse-driven heparin protocol, heparin infusions were being managed by a pharmacist at our institution. Of note, there were different transitions that needed to take place at different divisions. Our first step was to create a multidisciplinary team that included frontline nurses, providers, such as residents and hospitalists, pharmacy staff, and some of our safety specialists to conduct an FMEA prior to implementation. Upon completion and identification of areas of concern, nursing professional practice or our nursing educators work directly with the clinical informatics team to create and actively complete the education. So how did we actually make this transition? So it occurred in the middle of the week on a Wednesday to ensure there was enough time both before and after the go live to assist all nursing staff in the transition. One-on-one -on -one support was provided for the first few days for all nurses 
who were running a nurse driven heparin protocol. We also wanted to ensure proper initiation and titration. So all, all nurse driven heparin protocols were also looked at by pharmacists who continue to monitor and assist nursing staff. However, what actually happens after the day of go live? So post go live, all orders continue to be reviewed for issues. These were reviewed by pharmacists, nurse educators, and our nurses from the clinical informatics department. If any issue was identified, one-on-one -on -one support was continued to be given to the nurses involved. However, the major issue in this process was that all interventions were retrospective. In other words, issues were identified after an error in either the initiation, titration, or a lab draw was already completed. This did continue for approximately three months. You may ask, how did we decide on three months? Well, we continued to monitor the number of issues being reported via our event reporting system. And at that time, since we saw a significant decrease in the number of events being reported, the one-on-one -on -one and continued monitoring was therefore halted. However, as all implementations go, nine months later, we noticed an increase in the number of events being reported in our reporting system. So this prompted myself as the medication safety officer to do a deeper dive and garner more information that could be shared with my nursing colleagues. On this slide, you'll see a graphical illustration that shows the number of heparin events that were reported on a monthly basis. Along the x-axis, you'll see the months followed on the y-axis shows the number of events. What is important to consider here is that these are self-reported or voluntarily reported events. So in essence, the number may actually be higher than what we're actually seeing. Furthermore, we wanted to break down our events by location, especially for our nursing colleagues. So on the x-axis, lengthwise, you will see the different units that have the events. On the y-axis shows the number of events. Finally, the different colors represent the different months being tracked. In this case, it is July through October of 2022. And to do an even deeper dive, we actually look at exactly what type of events are occurring. So similar to the prior slide, on the x-axis, you'll see the type of events and the number of events is reported on the, y, on the Y axis. Again, the different colors represent the different months that are actually being tracked here. So from all of this data that is shared with our nursing colleagues, what has happened and what are our future directions? So where we go from here. So every time an event related to the nurse driven heparin protocol occurs, at our institution, we have the nurse manager complete what we like to call a mini apparent cause analysis. In other words, this is includes the five whys to drill down as to why the event actually occurred. So what have we found from this? We've revealed that there's actually interpretation issues with our electronic health record. And furthermore, our nurses continue to have some issues programming our IV pumps. So what have we done about this? We've re-educated all nurses during our annual competencies. We continue to have immediate notification to all nurse managers and bedside nurses when issues are identified. This monthly reporting is completed at our medication safety meeting, as well as nurse huddles. And finally, in the near future, we will be employing the resources of a few human factors engineer. I thank you for your time. And I'd like to turn the program over to Christopher. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Um, so at this point, we're going to transition to um, our medication um, history technician pilot program uh, that we've had in place for several years. And I wanted to share with the group today the um, uh, um, process on how we got started in our journey 
uh, for creation of the position and the service line. So, um, just wanted to go over briefly um, the definition of um, you know medication reconciliation. Of course, process of comparing meds that the patient has been taking prior to admission um, with the medications that the organization is about to provide. Um, more importantly, though, <clears throat> in order to do that, and uh, that's typically the function of a provider. Uh, to make that decision whether or not to continue a medication uh, on admission, say, into a hospital. Um, more importantly is the uh, presentation of a accurate list or as accurate as possible to that provider um, so they can make the best decisions possible. So, and that's really the crux of, of what the medication history technician position does uh, here at our facility. So, one of the things that we, we identified uh, before we started the program was, you know, what are some of the barriers to obtaining a medication history? Um, and this is actually information from a survey that was uh, published several years ago um, from community pharmacists and, and emergency department personnel. Um, so, essentially, um, you know, there is no computer system interface between outpatient and inpatient systems. Uh, there's no shared EHR uh, in our health uh, system or, or our, our industry at this point. Um, so there's no single common database database where all this information is stored. Um, and you know, uh, when patients do present to places like an emergency department, um, you know, many of them do not have um, you know a complete up to date list, um, and uh, they do use more than one pharmacy typically. Um, the staff also in this particular survey uh, expressed concerns of, you know, calling out to other facilities, um, you know, uh, would be potentially a HIPAA breach. Um, and uh, finally, and most importantly, in this particular survey, uh, staff lacks the time to complete a review of the medica patient's medications. So, how long does it take to perform an accurate medication history? Well, a review of the literature uh, shows us that, um, you know, uh, this is across multiple disciplines in multiple settings. Um, you know, one particular uh, survey or sorry, uh, um, study uh, physicians took an average of 45 minutes to obtain medication histories, nurses 24 minutes. Um, and including, uh, you know, an actual uh, time spent contacting outside sources like retail pharmacies and doctor's offices. Uh, upwards of 27 minutes on average. So, as you can see, um, some of these times may be surprising to, to some folks who may not have experience in this. Uh, but for those of us that have performed uh, medication histories, uh, this was not a surprise. And I think one of the challenges is, is, is for um, facilities to recognize that this actually does take this long a period of time and this does take resource to do it properly. So, uh, at St. Joe's, we did a pilot program uh, because we uh, received a lot of spontaneous voluntary reports uh, of, um, you know, inaccurate medication history. Um, and, uh, you know, what we did find also was that our uh, process for collecting medication histories um, was spread across multiple disciplines and wasn't coordinated very well. We were pretty much uh, had a lot to um, kind of um, address when we looked at this pursuant to reported medication errors. So, uh, first thing we did was a survey. Uh, we surveyed ER nurses, uh, providers, admitting providers, and also pharmacists um, to see exactly where they thought we stood with our current um, medication uh, reconciliation process. We did a survey of, uh, like I said, of nurses, uh, ER nurses, uh, pharmacists, and uh, admitting hospitalists, and um, really, um, you know, just asked them, you know, what are your barriers? Uh, what are, what are we seeing in terms of admission medication histories? Um, so, of course, uh, you know, uh, what we got back was not too surprising. Medication lists were outdated and inaccurate, uh, the ones the patients brought in. Uh, ED nurses spend significant time gathering these this information. And again, this is time that they weren't necessarily resourced for, um, you know, in their current duties. Um, and uh, so as such, the list presented to providers uh, weren't as accurate and complete as they possibly could have been. 
Um, so pharmacists were getting these sheets. Uh, this is back in paper orders at the time. So they were getting these sheets and had to spend time clarifying them with the providers. Um, and so overall staff satisfaction with this entire process was fairly low. So we did a medication history technician uh, pilot program in uh, 2014. Uh, and you can see the goal was to develop a process of in inserting this particular resource into the um, admission medication reconciliation process. We did it over a summer. I was actually resourced to pharmacy interns um, plus some technician time as well to uh, help uh, collect the data um, and see, um, you know, and document, uh, you know, other portions of the pilot. Um, so, and we also wanted to assess the impact of the program as well. We gathered uh, a lot of folks interdisciplinary group to get this uh, pilot program started. And you can see uh, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, pharmacy techs, interns, and so forth, educators. So, uh, it's a pretty robust group that um, was involved in the project. And some of our objectives, again, um, were uh, to obtain a process flow. It's always important to identify metrics, develop a standardized data collection tool, training documents, education, and compile pro uh, weekly progress reports. So here's our, uh, you know, initial um, process flow. Um, and again, this is not what it is today, of course, um, but that's what we started off with. So I would recommend anybody that's implementing a new process to come up with a process flow such as this. We also developed a education uh, tool for all the folks, uh, the interns and the technician who were uh, participating in this to um, really to, to have the same approach when interacting with patients and collecting their medication histories. And this was, um, you know, education, both printed um, and also face to face that we're able to, you know, spend some time with each one of the, um, you know, the, the uh, folks from the technical staff that were uh, engaging in this pilot program. So some of the data that we collected, um, again, we had a standardized data collection tool. Um, we looked at admission versus non-admission. We recognized from the very beginning that we weren't always going to be able to target, um, you know, just the patients being admitted to the ED or through the ED. Uh, oftentimes it can be difficult to tease out just um, admitted patients. Um, you know, so we, you know, knew that we were going to uh, inadvertently, um, you know, uh, collect data or can get medication lists on non admitted patients as well as admitted patients. So we wanted to kind of collect those numbers, number of home medications, of course, um, that the uh, histories were involved with taking number of medications with discrepancies, meaning, um, you know, whether the patient didn't know what they were taking or it was different from what we had um, in our database from previous prior admissions and, and encounters. Uh, allergies, um, the technicians were also, you know, um, uh, verifying allergies and reactions with patients and, and documenting them as well. Uh, and number of medication issues rectified, meaning if there was no knowledge of what the patient was taking at home, um, then the technician um, would then call out to the pharmacy or doctor's office to get that information uh, cleared um, and hopefully completed. So that was uh, collected as well. And most importantly, of course, time spent um, with the whole process from the time they introduced themselves to the patient to the, to the time they were done documenting uh, the actual history itself. So um, we were able to uh, collect, like, like I said, uh, a pretty decent amount of information. Um, this is the an example of one of the metrics that we collected. Uh, this is the uh, number of admissions that we were able to capture. And really, we were only staffing the ER one shift a day, uh, typically 1230 to nine. Um, really, it was only during the weekdays that we did this. Um, so, but as you can see, the blue uh, shaded area was the percent or number of admitted patients that we actually were able to, um, you know, have histories taken by the pilot uh, program. So about 70% of admissions through the whole um, process was covered by this particular pilot, which exceeded our expectations. 
Uh, and again, a lot, lots of allergy information. Um, th this is just the number of um, updated report, uh, updated charts uh, with new allergy information that was able to be, um, you know, clarified by the uh, technician. And again, uh, the not admitted patients. Uh, this was a surprising number for us. Uh, we did actually have a lot of patients that we. Um, did histories on that were ultimately not admitted to the facility. Um, so we did um, you know, collect data on that as well. Um, this was an incidental finding. Actually, I apologize, jumping around a little bit. Um, this was actually uh, uh, at the same time that we were doing this particular pilot, uh, one of our med surge floors was doing um, a uh, discharge uh, uh, process imp improvement plan as well. And as you can see, average time to actually um, re to discharge a patient, um, it is actually um, one, two, five down from the top, went from 33 minutes to 19 minutes. Um, and this was attributed to the actual accuracy of the medication lists, uh, which actually flows from you know, admission to discharge. So that was a positive finding as well. Um, with this uh, during this time. So, all in all, uh, over uh, 500 patients or 526 uh, patients were seen by the uh, med history technicians, um, just over 11,000 minutes, um, 22 minutes per patient. Again, so this is similar to what we've seen in the literature, um, a lot more than, than some may have initially kind of thought in the beginning. Before doing this, pro this this pilot project, and this is an average amount of time, I can tell you some patients um, you know took over an hour because uh, they had you know many many different medications that they were taking, um, and average number of meds per patient is nine in the, uh, at this time, uh, and the number of medications with at least one problem. When I say problem, I mean clarification that needed to happen whether. Uh, you know, the, the dose was unknown or uh, the name of the medication was unknown even uh, that needed required a call out to the uh, retail pharmacy or physician's office. Uh, as you can see, it was 90%, uh, which was updated in the record after it was clarified. So many of those were actually um, able to be clarified in the chart. So more complete records could be passed along to the admitting provider to do the actual reconciliation. And the impact on quality, of course. Um, you know, the number of patients that were seen with nine medications each, uh, these uh, medications were evaluated and uh, you can make the argument that each one of these is a potential error uh, that could have been inter uh, introduced into our med uh, use process that were ultimately avoided by this, uh, by this quality um, service. So all in all, our pilot program was successful. We did uh, you know, initially have one FTE that was approved. Uh, in our ED to cover the evenings, uh, mainly uh, you know, 1230 to 9 p.m. was our first um, shift that we covered. We did add a second uh, FTE within three months. Uh, you know, leadership here in the hospital, um, you know, felt that this was a very important uh, program to grow. And we actually added an additional one and a half FTEs within the last two years here. Um, one of those FTEs is actually in our short procedure unit and you know it does essentially the same thing uh, with our procedural patients. So uh, uh, all in all, uh, improvement in admission medication reconciliation can significantly improve quality of care for our patients. Uh, medication history technicians can improve the med rec process and gain downstream efficiencies, um, and they can also save labor costs as well. We didn't get too much into this, um, but that's something that you know also potentially build into a plan if, if um, you were interested in doing something like this. Um, you know, it, rather than you can certainly have this function performed by a medication, um, you know, by a pharmacy technician, um, you know, rather than, you know, having downstream issues with uh, nurses, pharmacists, and providers whose time is reimbursed at a higher rate, of course. Okay. Um, that's that ends my segment. So I'll just open it up for questions. Thanks so much, Megan, Jennifer, and Christopher. So, Megan, it looks like the first question that we have is directed to you. 
Can you explain again how your staff are nominated for your Good Catch, Great Catch program? Thank you, Shelley. Certainly. Uh, we accept nominations for those awards specifically through our internal reporting system. And that was one of the things that we actually updated uh, a couple of years ago. We saw it as we showed from our data in 2019, we had a good number of people getting those awards, but we wanted to increase that. So what we did was we made a change with our form to allow for the person submitting the incident to provide that nomination themselves. And that person is able when they submit an uh, uh, incident report to nominate either their self or someone else. And that's been a very popular option because oftentimes uh, when someone is reporting an event, they would like to give credit where it's due to a colleague who may have assisted and pointed out to them that this is a concern. For example, as a pharmacist, if I'm entering a medication error report, it might have been brought to my attention by a nurse or by a pharmacy technician. I can then enter their name to be recognized right directly within the report so that they will receive that recognition. Um, so that's been very popular. And if that's not completed, when the events are reviewed by the file managers and in follow-up, they can also add nominations to provide credit for their staff. Thanks, Megan. The next question is for all of our uh, presenters. Um, and the question is, have the presenters published their work? So, Megan, we'll start with you. I have not, but uh, sounds like I could be pretty busy with this for a while. Thanks for the suggestion. Jen, how about you? Um, unfortunately, I have to echo Megan in saying uh, not at this time. And finally, how about Christopher? Uh, yeah, like my colleagues, unfortunately, not no uh, publish. Uh, I haven't published this, um, but again, great idea. Thank you. The next question looks like it's for Christopher. Do you see a medication reconciliation tech position as a career path for pharmacy techs? Have you had issues finding staff for this position? Uh, great question. Um, absolutely. Um, I do see this as a potential career path for uh, pharmacy technicians. Um, <clears throat> actually, our current staff has been in their, their role for um, uh, the, our original um, uh, technician who started with us with this program is still in that same role today. Uh, she's actually our technician up in short procedure unit. Um, so I, I not only see this as a career path, but I can also see this uh, process being replicated in other settings in acute and uh, primary care um, locations as well. Um, so do, do I have a, uh, an issue with staffing this? Um, I think, you know, the broader question is, yes, I, I do, but I think it's, it's really a result of, you know, um, other labor shortages that are going on in our industry at this point. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next question is also for Christopher. Do the medication technician uh, positions have other duties other than me medication reconciliation, or is that their sole function? That's a, another great question. Um, and that's something that in the beginning, when we first developed this, uh, this particular position, we wanted to keep it focused solely on medication history, um, you know, responsibilities. However, we've through the years, we have seen the value in having perhaps a shared uh, position where you would have, you know, technicians cross trained in, say, operations um, and distribution, and then also being able to step into this role, especially with our uh, part time position um, to, you know, especially to, to cover um, each other, say, you know, uh, sick calls and, and holidays and whatnot. So great question. Um, yeah, so at this point, we're mainly focused uh, on a, you know, um, you know, a specialist specialty role at this point, but I think in the future, if folks cross trained. Thanks, Chris. Jen, the next question is for you. Uh, in relation to your nurse driven heparin protocol, how did you close the loop with nurses and provide feedback about the events that they were reporting? So all events that get reported um, through our event reporting system are immediately communicated to the nurse manager of that unit to ensure that they're aware of it. And that nurse manager then has the responsibility to complete their apparent cause analysis or the five whys with the nurse who was involved in the incident, which was reported. 
Uh, furthermore, we closed the loop with all of the data that um, I showed today by reporting it both on our medication um, subcommittee, medication safety subcommittee, which our nursing educators do attend. And then furthermore, it's distributed at each nurse huddle, which is conducted on a weekly basis on each of the nursing units. Thanks, Jen. Megan, the next question is for you, and it's related to your barcode medication administration. Um, it looks like you had a very successful uh, percentage of staff that were completing uh, barcode administration. How did you um, keep this sustainable uh, for months on end? Because it looks like you continued uh, to exceed your goal for several months after. Um, and we are assuming this is an ongoing project. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Uh, it is ongoing, and as I had mentioned, we do routinely report this data out um, to our medication safety committee. So it is something we do have a constant pulse on to make sure we're monitoring. It's also a shared responsibility that our nursing leadership is responsible that they review their individual areas. And then we also have our clinical nurse specialist team who assists with that and reports out on that as well. Many of our units have quality boards and they report this data and they share it so staff can visually see right on the quality board on their unit, how is their compliance going? So we've been able to sustain this effort through the engagement of nursing leadership at multiple levels, as well as our frontline nurses and having that information readily available to them right on the unit. Thank you, Meg. The next question is for Jennifer. Jennifer, this is in relation to your medication safety huddle that uh, was created as an enterprise. Did this happen at your individual locations? And if so, how long did it take to go from the individual locations um, to starting the enterprise in May? So the individual locations, each individual locations had their own medication safety officer and those already had medication safety committees established. Um, Really what I think was happening was when we were encountering certain modifications that we wanted to make to the electronic health record that required what they considered enterprise approval or health system approval, we didn't often know who to go to or who to ask. Um, however, as the example I highlighted in the presentation today, oftentimes they were very easy to make by educated individuals such as ourselves. Um, so, I actually reached out to my colleagues to see if maybe this would be something that they would all be interested in that we could quickly make decisions and have those changes approved. Um, I would say it took maybe less than two months to really establish it and get everybody on board. I think it was something that was a long time coming that we probably should have um, established well before the time we did. Thank you. The next question is for Christopher. Uh, did you receive any pushback from leadership about adding this role of medication state, uh, medication technician? And if so, um, how was this dealt with? Well, I, I think um, the, the short answer to that is, is no, um, because I think the way it was designed, we were able to uh, kind of, you know, prevent a lot, prevent some of the pushback. By number one, you know, engaging nursing in this process from the very beginning by performing the survey um, and, you know, by really couching it in the sense that, you know, yeah, we have, um, you know, um, inaccurate, um, incomplete med histories being taken, but not because we have bad nurses. It's just because it's taken a very long time that we that we didn't resource them for. So I think, you know, when we, um, you know, share that kind of in that and couched it in that in those terms um, and said, you know, this is really going to be a, you know, a time saver for ED nurses and it's going to help ED throughput, which is a hot button issue um, any day of the week, really in healthcare and, and acute care anyway. Um, I think that's really, that prevented a lot of, you know, potential questions um, and concerns from, from senior staff. And we also had, you know, really strong advocate uh, in our, um, you know, for that, that was part of the project group to, to begin with. So I think when we partnered with these folks, uh, you know, we, we were able to, you know, kind of, um, circumvent a lot of that concern. Thanks, Chris. Jennifer, this question is for you. Did you encounter any obstacles or delays when making your changes to the EHR? Uh, I believe this is in reference to your nurse driven heparin protocol. 
Um, no, not not with our EHR and our nurse driven heparin protocol. And if you're talking about any changes uh, regarding when we did the establishment of our medication safety enterprise uh, huddle, um, we actually established that to make quicker changes. So I think we were having a lot of problems prior to that because we didn't know exactly who would approve certain changes when it wasn't a specific um, area or practice area. Thank you. Megan, this question is for you in relation to your barcode medication administration portion. The uh, unit that you had indicated that was initially underperforming uh, and then uh, was able to start uh, meeting, re reaching your uh, entity goals, um, what was done to kind of uh, identify what the issues were there and how, how was that unit um, supported to be able to improve their numbers? Thanks for asking, Shirley. Uh, that particular area um, was a bit unique. They saw procedural patients. So what we identified through close analysis of the data was some workflow opportunities that were very specific to that area and with their patient flow to make sure we optimize scanning as patients may come to them receiving a medication, we have responsibilities to scan that in that unit then. Um, so that was unique to that area and identifying those specific workflows. And much credit is due for being able to do that to the development of the IT resources that we could really dig into the data and identify trends as far as what specific workflows needed attention and also the collaborative work with the nursing leadership for that area who were wonderful. And when you, when, you know, nurses are a very high achieving group of people, as you all well know. And when we see that data and we see that, oh, we're really not achieving what our goal is, we want to meet that. So it was very motivating for that group to dig into the data to see what workflows had opportunities and to really work together to address those. Thank you, Jen. This next question is for you. In relation to your nurse driven heparin protocol, I noticed that there were a few units that had zero events reported. Is that related to the types of medications that are provided or were those units truly without any incidents? So those units were truly without any incidents that were voluntarily reported or reported via our, um, our event reporting system. So we don't know that they were necessarily zero. We just know that there were zero events that were reported on those units uh, for those months of July, August, September, and October. Um, you know, we do include all the units on there just for awareness purposes. However, um, like I said, again, it's voluntary reporting, so we actually don't know if some of these incidents are actually happening and just not being reported. Thank you, Christopher. This question is for you. Can you speak to the process of um, how and who you had to have this um, position approved by as far as, um, you know, what are, what were the steps that were taken to kind of get the, your, from your proposal to actually getting this approved and then to get additional positions approved? Can you speak to kind of how that process took um, and give people a time frame of how long it actually took to get, do from like the initial proposal to actually getting the position approved? Well, <clears throat> And I think, um, you know, when we collected data uh, during that summer, um, uh, you know, and we're able to demonstrate and, you know, really significant benefit, um, you know, to a process that has um, been given us a lot of, or has been reported, um, you know, uh, a, a often in our MedAir reporting program. Uh, there was certainly an awareness, an organizational awareness, you know, um, from the very beginning that we needed to do something. Um, plus, the you know, even though it's not technically a joint commission um, standard to have folks like this in place, uh, we were able to, um, you know, really say this will be a great story um, to to have, uh, you know, to tell surveyors. I think I believe that might have been a survey year for us, if I'm not mistaken. So that helped. Um, but either way, um, you know, really, when we were able to to gather that information, it took about three months. Um, we put together a proposal uh, for this, and again, uh, some of it was financial, 
So we really compared, you know, the nursing time that it took, uh, you know, compared to a med to a pharmacy technician um, salary and time it took, and you know, really said, look, this could be, you know, a time saver, uh, make making nurses more efficient, you know, in the emergency department. Um, not necessarily eliminating nursing positions, of course, but making their time more efficient. Uh, <clears throat> and then also we were able to link it to downstream efficiencies, both in, you know, uh, provider and pharmacists. Because remember, pharmacists were getting orders that were incomplete and inaccurate, having to call providers uh, to clarify orders on a regular basis. And that was included in, in our survey that we did. So I think you know, beyond the quality piece, which is uh, pretty, you know, uh, obvious in the data, we're ab also able um, to make a financial argument, um, you know, that, that these positions can, you know, save uh, money as well as, as time and increase quality of, of care. So I think, you know, from that time, we submitted it at the end of the summer, um, and I believe that next quarter, uh, we had the position approved. So uh, it was a, a pretty good success story from my standpoint. I wasn't used to getting approvals that quickly, but we were able to, you know, generate it pr pretty, uh, pretty quickly at that point. Thanks, Chris. Our webinar will be ending soon. If there is anyone else who has um, any questions, please type them in the Q and A box for us. And Jen, this final question that I have is for you. Uh, can you tell us how long your medication safety huddle enterprise lasts and um, if you follow a specific agenda? It lasts for uh, 60 minutes. It is on a monthly basis, as I had mentioned previously. And we have not established um, necessarily an exact agenda that we're going to follow each time. Uh, each of the different uh, med safety officers and pharmacists throughout the division will just let me know if there's anything that needs to be addressed on the agenda uh, for that month and that therefore we will talk about it. We do follow up on some items from the uh, prior meetings uh, when we first begin for typically the first 5 to 10, 15 minutes. Thanks so much. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. If you experienced any issues accessing the evaluation, or Certificate of Continuing Education, please feel free to direct any inquiries to Shelly Mikesell at S-H-M-I-X-E-L-L at PA.gov. This concludes our webinar. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day.